Good afternoon, everybody. My name is David Goodman. I'm the director of the China Studies Center. And uh, before we start, may I welcome you to a web website hosted on the lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, on lands which were never given and never ceded. And we appreciate and acknowledge the work of their elders, past, present, and emerging. Uh, today's Talks in Chinese Humanities is sponsored as usual by uh, the China Studies Center, by the Department of Chinese at the University of Sydney, and the Australian Society for Asian Humanities, as well as the faculties of arts and the Faculty of Art, Design and Architecture at the University of New South Wales. Our speaker today is uh, Koji Hirata, who is recently appointed and taken up a position at Monash University in the Department of History. He studied politics and law at the University of Tokyo, and he, as an undergraduate, and then he did his MPhil uh, at uh, uh, Bristol University in history, and then his PhD at Stanford. So he's been around the world doing all these things. Uh, later on, he was a research fellow at Emmanuel College, Cambridge, and then he joined Monash. His research is, touches on modern China, Japan and Russia, or the Soviet Union, as some people would call it, and uh, has broader implications for global histories of capitalism and socialism. I'm gonna hand over to him in a minute, uh, but I'm going to ask you if you have questions that you would like to put to Koji at the end of the, uh, his lecture and his presentation, please put your questions in the Q and A facility in the Zoom um, um, and, uh, app on the bottom of your screen, and I will put the questions to him later. So now over to you, Koji. Thank you very much for agreeing to give this talk. Yep, thank you. So first of all, I'd like to thank David and Yenping and all the other colleagues for inviting me to this event. And it is a tremendous honor for me to have the opportunity to present a portion of my research with distinguished colleagues from the University of Sydney and the University of New South Wales. So at the moment, so I am actually in Shanghai. And unfortunately, I have come down with a cold. So I must extend my apologies if my voice is not as strong as it should be. So anyway, so today, so I will talk about my forthcoming book. The book will visit China's socialist industrialization under Mao Zedong from a transnational perspective. I do this through a case study of 20th century China's largest steel enterprise called Anshan Iron and Steelworks or Angan. So Angan is located in the city of Anshan in northeast China the region historically referred to as Manchuria. And to begin with, I'd like you to take a look at this picture taken in Angan. And actually, this is a somewhat unusual picture, considering it was taken in 1953. So what makes this picture surprising is that so these people posing in it are actually not Chinese, but are in fact Japanese engineers. So in 1953, eight years after the end of World War II. So just so to give you some context surrounding this photo, let me briefly walk you through the basic, basic historical timeline. So as probably most of you know, so Manchuria was under Japanese occupation for 14 years until the end of the Second World War, Second World War II. Oh, like in 1955, 45. And this was soon followed by the Chinese Civil War between the Nationalist Party and the Communist Party. And the Civil War concluded with a Communist victory. And in 1949, the Communist Party established the People's Republic of China, or PRC. And Mao Zedong's leadership in the PRC continued until his death in 1976. So now uh, returning to this picture of Japanese people in Angan. 
this unpublished photo was shared with me by the children of these engineers. And it reveals an aspect of Angan's history that is left largely untold in its official version. So Angan was actually initially founded as a Japanese enterprise in 1917. So the Japanese engineers in the picture had been employed at the Japanese controlled Angan until the end of World War II. But following Japan's defeat, the Chinese authorities required them to continue working in the same factories until 1953. And actually, this story of Angan was not so unique. Like Angan, many other state-owned enterprises in Manchuria had originally been established by the Japanese before 1945. So in Mount China, the industrialization strategy essentially followed what was then called socialist industrialization or the Soviet-style development policy with focus on state-owned enterprises, SOEs, and heavy industry. And the steel complex of Angan in the city of Anshan was a symbol of China's socialist industrialization. Angan was one of the largest SOEs and it was the biggest producer of steel, a sector which was arguably the single most important in the socialist system. So as you see here, in the initial decade of the PRC, so Angan accounted for approximately half of China's steel production, and it remained the largest steel maker in China until the late 1980s. So in essence, Angan was socialist industrialization. So Angan was among many other SOEs in Manchuria or Northeast China, Dongbei, which was the model region of socialist industrialization. So the Northeast had the largest cluster of heavy industry SOEs in Mount China. And my forthcoming book is a case study of Angan from around 1915 until 2000. And it has so one main argument and three related uh, more specific arguments. So the main argument of the book is that socialist industrialization in China and elsewhere was part of a larger global history of late industrialization that encompassed both capitalist and socialist worlds. And this argument is connected to three more specific arguments. First, Manchuria as a transnational borderland played a crucial role in the making of China's socialist industrialization. And second, technology transferred and their politics were entangled in late industrialization. And third, the process of industrialization under socialism involved constant contention among various organizations and, and individuals, both within and outside the state authority. And my research was facilitated by archives and interviews in multiple countries. Unfortunately, Chinese archives have increasingly become closed over the past decade. So in the summer of 2013, I visited the Anshan Municipal Archives and I was almost arrested under suspicion of espionage. And afterwards, I still tried to use the city archives and also the Angan's company archives, but I was constantly denied access. Nevertheless, numerous published and unpublished sources were still available in China, at least during the 2010s. So employing a method known as sinological garbage, I purchased discarded government documents and other published primary, um, sorry, other unpublished primary sources from used book dealers in China. And in addition to these sources, my research also draws upon primary sources that I discovered outside of China, especially in archives in Taiwan, Japan, and Russia. So here is a, the table of contents for my book, Making Mao's Steelworks in the Steel Manchuria and the Transnational Origins of Chinese Socialism, which is forthcoming from Cambridge University Press in RE 2024. So 
This book comprises eight chapters divided into like three parts. So part one includes two chronological chapters that explore the Japanese, Soviet, and the nationalist law prior to Chinese communist control. And part two consists of four thematic chapters focusing on the first decade of communist rule and the introduction of Soviet style socialism to China. And part three includes two chronological chapters on the period after 1957, when China tried to diverge from the Soviet model and pass through a uniquely Chinese model of socialism. And for the remainder of this presentation today, so I will primarily focus on material from chapter three, making Manchuria wet. An earlier version of this chapter is also available as a journal article in American Historical Review. And here is an overview of the rest of my presentation. So I will start with the free communist period, Ang Anshan, and then I will describe the law of Manchuria in the RVPRC. And then I will explore the Japanese and nationalist engineers, how they worked in communist Manchuria. And then the last part of the presentation, we will explore Japanese and nationalist legacies in China in the mid 1950s. So first pre-communist Manchuria. The Japanese began to build its informal empire in Manchuria following the victory in the Russo-Japanese war. And in 1917, so the Japanese government began to construct ancient iron works and the Seitetsujo. And this marked the beginning of the modern iron and steel industry in Anshan. And also another impo an important world historical event of this period, the entire period was that the rise of the Soviet Union, which stimulated the global fascination with economic planning. And the Soviet Union actually so captivated the world with its rapid industrial expansion during their first five-year plan from 1928 to 1932. And the Soviet achievements also inspired uh, some Japanese, particularly those in Manchuria, so where these Japanese researchers studied and translated Soviet materials. Then in 1931, the Japanese army occupied Manchuria. And next year, so they founded the puppet regime of Manchukuo. And one of the principal goals of the occupation was to develop heavy industry to prepare for Japan's future wars. And many of Manchukuo's economic policies selectively learned from the Soviet model. And however, uh, they never talked about the Soviet influence publicly. So therefore, I would say the Japanese in Manchukuo smuggled the Soviet model. And in 1937, Manchukuo launched its five-year plan, which was at least partly inspired by the Soviet five-year plans. So in this context, the Japanese occupation regime transformed ancient iron works into a far bigger steel enterprise, Showa Steelworks, in 1933. And Showa Steelworks expanded rapidly by utilizing the cutting edge technologies purchased from the German conglomerate group. The Manchukuo state uh, maintained control over the management and ownership of strategically vital enterprises, including Showa Steelworks. And the Manchukuo government also provided it with various forms of subsidies. And the most egregious form of uh, state subsidy was the forced waiver of Chinese prisoners of war. And during the war, the Japanese army sent Chinese POWs to important Japanese enterprises in Manchuria, including Showa Steelworks. And actually, not all of them were really like military personnel. So there is evidence that the Japanese troops randomly captured Chinese residents in occupied areas and transported them to Manchuria under the guise of POWs. And the Showa Steelworks uh, also mobilized these POWs and civilians, labeling them as special workers or Tokushu Kojin. And the Japanese treatment of these like POW or forced laborers was often very violent. For instance, 
In October 1943, the Japanese military police in Anshan publicly executed three POWs who had attempted to escape. And simultaneously, during World War II, so state-directed industrialization was also in progress in other parts of China, so within the nationalist-controlled regions of China. So during the war, the China's nationalist government relocated inland. And within this free China, the nationalist government assumed control over the majority of heavy industry enterprises as SOEs. And notably, the Chinese nationalist officials often referred to the Soviet Union as a model for China's economic policy. That said, although nationalist China and Manchukuo shared similar policy ideas on industrialization, Manchukuo's industry was considerably larger in scale. So Japanese occupied Manchuria was basically the only region in China with a stable government throughout the war period, ironically. And consequently, Manchukuo emerged as the largest heavy industry region in China. In its peak year of 1943, Manchukuo produced 49% of the coal, 91% of the steel, and 67% of the electricity in all of China. And after Japan's defeat in August 1945, the Soviet Union occupied Manchuria until the spring of, 1960, of 1946. And during this occupation, the Soviets dismantled machinery from Japanese factories to use them uh, in the Soviet Union. And in China today, so there is a common belief that the Soviets removed all the equipment and therefore the industry in Manchuria during the PRC had no connection to the facilities from the Japanese period. And actually this narrative is historically inaccurate. So the truth is, the Soviet removal of industrial facilities was significant, but it was not total. So a considerable amount of facilities still remained even after the Soviet occupation. And following the Soviet withdrawal, China's nationalist government took over Anshan and other industrial basic, uh, bases in Manchuria in the spring of 1946. And to take over Japanese factories, a large number of Chinese managers and engineers relocated to Manchuria from the former Free China. And the nationalists also uh, forced many Japanese engineers and scientists to remain in the industry for the industrial reconstruction. So now let's examine what the nationalists took or take over mean for the organization of the former Japanese factories in Manchuria. So just Please look at this map. So this map was created by the US military for the bombing of Anshan in 1944. So as you can see in this map, so Japanese period industry consisted of a cluster of private enterprises next to the state controlled Showa steel works. But when the nationalists took over both this state owned Showa steel works and these private enterprises in 1946, they amalgamated all these farms into a single vertically integrated state-owned enterprise. And so this is how like Angan as an SOE came into existence under, under the nationalists. And later the communists inherited this nationalist organizational structure. And this, this happened not just in An Anshan. So this way the nationalists amalgamated over 293 enterprises in Manchuria into just 20 SOEs, 20, 20 state-owned enterprises. This means that the size of each industrial enterprise became considerably larger than the Japanese period. And these SOEs in Manchuria were expected to play a major role in the nationalist post-war reconstruction. However, as we all know, the nationalist war soon overthrown by the communists in the civil war. And the communist party effectively gained the control of all of Manchuria by late 1948, 
So about one year before winning the civil war in you know entire China. And as the, so Manchuria was the first industrialized region under communist control. So it played a central role in the Communist Party's transition from a decentralized organization to a centralized bureaucratic state. And this process was led by this man, Gao Gan, the communist regional leader in Manchuria at the time. And to manage large modern industrial enterprises like Angan, the communists in Manchuria experimented with new Soviet style economic planning. And after the founding of the People's Republic in October 1949, Manchuria really served as a model for economic planning at the national level. In 1952, the PLC established the State Planning Commission, or Gochaji Huawei Yunfui, which was a Soviet style central economic planning agency. And its first director was this man, Gao Gan. And of the original 17 members of the commission, seven had experience in Manchuria. So Manchuria, so the communist first experimented this Soviet style planning in Manchuria, and then it spread out into the rest of the country. So why is that? Because Manchuria was the model region for socialist industrialization, which focused in SOEs and heavy industry. So among the major, the major essentially among the major industrial regions in China, Manchuria had uh, by far the highest concentration of SOEs. So this graph above compares the proportions of SOEs in industrial output of Manchuria with uh, East China around Shanghai, as well as the national average. So as you can see, so from the very beginning of the PLC, so SOEs dominated uh, Manchurian industry because of the nationalist introduction of the SOE system after World War II. Meanwhile, like the industrial economy of the Shanghai region remained largely in the hands of private enterprises during the early PLC. So it took the PLC government one decade to fully uh, implement the SOE system nationwide. And also from the beginning of the PLC, Manchuria's industry was uh, heavily focused on heavy industry. So this, the lower, the second graph compared the proportions of heavy industry in Liaoning province in Manchuria, uh, where Angan is located, and Shanghai so in the east of China, and China as a whole. So as you can see, so heavy industry was the main component of Manchurian industry from the very beginning of the PLC. And in contrast, Shanghai's industry was dominated by light industry. The dominance of heavy industry in Manchuria was a legacy of the Japanese occupation. So throughout the Mao era and beyond, the proportion of heavy industry in Manchuria remained much higher like it done in the rest of China. So in short, among different regions within China, Manchuria most closely resembled the Communist Party's vision of socialist industrialization because of the legacies from Imperial Japan and the nationalist China. And Chairman Mao clearly recognized the historical irony in this. So in a meeting with the Soviet Minister of Foreign Trade, Anastas Mikoyan in 1949, so Chairman Mao stated, and I quote, the industry occupies 10% of the entire economy of China with the exception of Manchuria, where it occupies 53%. And Mao further told Mikoyan, so the Japanese and the nationalists promoted concentration of capital in the hands of the state. For instance, in Manchuria, industry occupies 53% of the economy, of which 47% is in the hands of the state, and 66% owned by private capital. So how did this, was this possible? So the thing is to reconstruct this industry in Manchuria, the communists 
party also recruited Japanese and Chinese nationalist exports in often forceful ways. For instance, uh, upon occupying An Anshan in February uh, 1948, the communists captured 104 Japanese engineers and about 30 nationalist engineers and six nationalist managers. And in a wider Manchuria in 1950, about 2,500 Japanese technicians and 4,800 Japanese skilled workers were employed by various enterprises and government offices in Manchuria. And the reconstruction of Angan and other Manchurian enterprises served as an important channel for technology transfer. And Japanese engineers at Angan provided young Chinese staff members with technical training. So while cooperation with Japanese and nationalist Chinese was practically indispensable, it is also important to remember that such cooperation was politically undesirable as it could potentially damage the Communist Party's political and ideological stance. And in October 1949, Chen Yun, one of the primary economic policy makers of the PRC, told the Soviet ambassador, and I quote, from the nationalists, the new government inherited a total of 20,000 engineers and experts, the majority of whom are reactionary and pro-American in their political beliefs. In the larger steel industrial complex in Anshan, Manchuria, 62 out of 70 engineers are Japanese who have hostile attitudes towards the Chinese in general and towards the Chinese communists particularly. So for the communist readers, their cooperation with the Japanese and to some extent the nationalists as well was a temporary arrangement that they reluctantly chose due to their lack of alternative sources of expertise. And to incentivize these Japanese and the nationalist knowledge workers to work for them, the communists at Angan implemented a careful policy. On one hand, the communists incorporated nationalist experts into the new political system. So around this time, the communists often emphasized their trust in the nationalist engineers of Chinese patriots and they made sure that they would not become targets of political persecutions, at least in the early years of the PLC. On the other hand, the communists managed and co-opted the Japanese engineers through material benefits and the segregation. The Japanese engineers at Angan enjoyed, actually enjoyed much higher salaries, better food, better housing, and better medical services than the Chinese colleagues. But at the same time, the Japanese were made to live in one segregated area in the city, which was insulated from the local population. And also for the Japanese children, the communist authorities in Anshan established a small school staffed by Japanese teachers. And some of these uh, children must be my interviewees, but unfortunately I cannot identify which individuals I met and obviously they have changed a lot. And this separate school is very representative of the privileged but segregated life that the Japanese experts held in communist Angan. By the way, so on the site of this Japanese school in Anshan is now Starbucks, where I spent quite a lot of time while during my stay in Anshan. And because the Japanese and Chinese were segregated in everyday life. So the only place where the two groups had substantial interactions was in the workplace. Interestingly here, nationalism on both sides sometimes worked in a positive way by putting Chinese and Japanese in competition within the structure created by the communists. So one example is Yan Shutan, so a former nationalist Chinese engineer, who recalls that the Communist Party supported his opinion when he disagreed with his Japanese colleagues. So during the reconstruction of Angan, and Yan later recalled, and I quote, it made the workers extremely happy to find that a Chinese engineer had knowledge and opinion and dared to maintain his own opinion. 
I was almost enormously touched because I had the support of the Communist Party organization and I was proud and elated in front of the foreigners. And the Japanese engineers, at least some of them, also became motivated to work as effectively as possible to prove how capable the Japanese were. So here's the excerpt from the unpublished memoirs of Japanese engineer Koike Motoji, so who reconstructed Angan's cork oven in 1949, and I quote, when crimson corks were extruded and fell to the fire extinguishing car, I was very happy, shouted Banzai alone, and could not help tears from running from my eyes. And Mr. Watanabe also came up onto the oven, and we went into each other's arms and wept together. It was the first time that I felt such a moving emotion. Why? Probably I was thinking that in front of the Soviets and the company managers, we must do it for the pride of the Japanese. So this kind of mentality really reminds me of the British soldiers in the movie, The Bridge on the River Kwai. So these accounts list that both nationalist Chinese and Japanese engineers came to take pride in their participation in the reconstruction of Angan despite their fierce opposition to each other. So in essence, the Japanese and nationalist Chinese were competing with each other in their contributions to the communist reconstruction of industrial Manchuria. Then the PLC's use of Chinese, uh, sorry, Japanese and nationalist Chinese exports became increasingly problematic as a result of the intensification of the Cold War. So in 1950, the PLC joined the Korean War and the Jiaming War, the PLC deepened its cooperation with the Soviet Union. And as the Soviet experts began to arrive in Manchuria, the Communist Party no longer needed the Japanese engineers. So in 1953, the PLC agreed to repatriate the remaining Japanese from Manchuria. And then in con on the contrary, the nationalist engineers remained in China and unsurprisingly, many of them would become victims of political persecutions later, and especially during the Cultural Revolution. So, so now going to the mid 1950s, the PLC's first five-year plan of 1953 to 57 was really a product of the Sino-Soviet partnership during the, Cold War, the early Cold War period. And the five-year plan aimed to achieve the heavy industrialization of China through collaboration with the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union sent engineers and scientists to China to construct factories like Angan, and thousands of Chinese engineers and scientists also went to the Soviet Union for internships in various Soviet SOEs. However, even during this period, the Japanese and the nationalist legacies in Manchuria persisted in one way or another. For instance, uh, in February 1952, so Chen Yin advised Chairman Mao that focusing investment on Manchuria would be more fruitful, and I quote, so even though these factories in Manchuria lost important equipment after Japan's surrender, the foundation of the factory still exists. If we purchase equipment and restore or expand these factories rather than open new factories elsewhere, we can reduce the cost of our investment considerably, obtain the return much more quickly, and speed up our pace significantly. So the regional allocation of investment uh, de demonstrates that this idea was indeed incorporated into the five-year plan. So as seen in the graph, so about 40% of industrial investment during the first five-year plan took place in Manchuria. So the PLC's first five-year plan used technologies imported from the Soviet Union to reconstruct and expand Japanese period factories in Manchuria rather than building new ones uh, from scratch. So this way, they saved the cost of the so industrialization. 
So just to conclude today's talk, so like there are like three arguments. So first, Japanese and nationalist legacies in Manchuria contributed to the building of the RVPLC's socialist industrialization in multiple ways. And second, China within the wider context of the, so like, you know, China, the so case of Maoist China also should be considered within the wider context of the reconstruction of East Asia after the collapse of the Japanese empire. So when it comes to this, the crafts and the legacies of the Japanese empire. So we people, scholars often look at places like Taiwan or Korea, but Manchuria should also be considered in this context to some extent. And then lastly, the evolution of capitalism and socialism in the 20th century involved a symbiotic process of mutual learning in which a global flow of ideas, technology, and know-how ran across political boundaries. So, the content of this material in this chapter was uh, the, an earlier burden was published as a journal article. So it's available in, from American Historical Review. So it's from the December of 2021 issue here. But then again, a more updated burden will be in my forthcoming book. So, and also like, you know, that today I only just talked about this, the Japanese and the national legacies in the RWPLC. But actually, so as you can, see from these chapters and pictures. The thing is, the story of Angan and industry of Manchuria was more than that. There are so many other fascinating stories that I can't just cover within like, you know, some 35 minutes talk. So there are things like, you know, this. So Angan served as one of the major projects where the Chinese and the Soviets worked together for the construction of industry in the 1950s. So it was the signature project of the first five-year plan. So I have a whole like, chapter about it. And also Manchuria, so the Angan was one of the major SOEs, which became as a model for the entire state-owned enterprise system in China. And also this is that's also a place where the Communist Party redefined the relationship between workers and enterprises. So there are all these some um, interesting stories here. And so please consider reading my book when it comes out next year, RV next year. And thank you so much. Now I welcome questions and comments from the audience. Very good. Thank you very much, Koji. Um, so if you have questions, please put them in questions and answers. I think maybe I will um, uh, use the privilege of being the chair to ask you a question and get things rolling, if you don't mind, Koji. Um, it's very interesting to hear about this involvement, first of Japanese and then of Soviet specialists in Angang um, in the first five year plan. What do you think the legacy of the, that period and the development of Angang was to industrial uh, policy after the withdrawal of Soviet specialists in 1960-61. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it is a very interesting, very important question. The thing is, it is very interesting in the thing is, uh, during the first five-year plan, Angan was the symbol of the Soviet cell industrialization. And then it was in many ways, the four landers or in the, you know, the Chinese learning from the Soviet industrialization model, there's not just technology, but also like, you know, there's some management system. But in some, sense, in some way, after 1957, the thing is, because of this legacy, it's kind of some people in Anshan used Angan in a more kind of opposite direction in attacking the Soviet model. So I think, so, some of you know, the audience might have heard of this called the Angan Constitution or Angan Shenfa. So this Angan Shenfa was essentially, so it was a political document written by the, Anshan, the Communist Party Anshan City Committee during the Great Leap Forward. So what the, the thing is, during the first five year plan, the Anshan City Committee and the Angan, so the city committee and the company were very like in rivalry, and then they hated each other. 
And what happened after the Sino-Soviet split and the Great Leap Forward was that the city committee, the city of Anshan, just used this political opportunity to attack Angan, and then they mobilized workers to attack these managers of Angan, and they wrote this report about how the mass mobilization just you know, saved Angan from the evil of the Soviet model. And then it was the report by the Anshan City community was really liked by Chairman Mao. And then this Angan constitution, which is actually a document attacking Angan, became kind of like you know some propaganda, like the uh, important like you know piece of propaganda during Cultural Revolution. So the thing is, ironically, Angan was later used as a like example of how wrong the Soviet model was how long the, this kind of Soviet model of technocratic and you know, more top-down management was wrong, and then how great this more kind of Chinese model of more like some mass-based, like you know, this more like you know, bottom-up mass mobilization style of like management was. So it's just, it's very complicated. So Angan has a complicated relationship with the Soviet model. Mm. So um, we didn't get uh, in industry learn from Angan. We got so, the industry learn from Daqing instead. Right. Yeah. Yeah. 